Oliver Rupp from the Buildings Performance Institute Europe in Brussels and maybe just two sentences about who we actually are. We are a, a non-profit, independent and relatively small think tank, also relatively young think tank. We were just founded about three years ago and uh, we're doing policy analysis in the field of energy efficiency in buildings. We're looking at all the European member states, how they implement the requirements which come from the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive and now in the future of course also more focus on the Energy Efficiency Directive. And we uh, publish reports uh, for free. We have a big data hub where you can find all kinds of statistical data about the European building stock, all kinds of uh, information about the policies which are being implemented and so on. So we're truly non-profit, independent and we're really driven by the mission to improve uh, policy making and implementation in the field of energy performance in buildings. So uh, that's about us. And um, one of our most recent publications is actually this guide uh, to developing strategies for uh, national building renovations. Um, because the Energy Efficiency Directive in Article 4 requires that member states do exactly that, to develop a national renovation strategy which has to be delivered in a first version in about a year from now, in April 2014, to the European Commission. And that national, uh, that national renovation strategy should incentivize deep renovation, should incentivize investments into a deep renovation of the European building stock. So the big question is, of course, how on earth can you <coughs> achieve that? And we thought it would maybe be useful to suggest a, a guide, a, a few steps, in particular because it's one of the few articles of the Energy Efficiency Directive where the Commission decided to not issue any guidance. For most of the other articles, the Commission is currently preparing so-called guidance documents, um, but not on the Article 4, so we thought, well, that's a very unique opportunity <coughs> to uh, put our ideas out there. Um, when we talk about and think about uh, deep renovation of the building stock, I think we need to take really more than one step back and avoid thinking only about energy cost savings, because that's one of the immediate and most obvious benefits. But when we look at uh, all the other impacts, the positive impacts, we can actually identify many, many other impacts. Uh, a lot of positive economic impacts in terms of uh, stimulating the economy, contributing to a growth of the GDP and, and so on, reducing energy imports, um, but also a lot of societal benefits like reduced fuel poverty and improved health and increased comfort and productivity. All of you who've uh, worked in a, in a, I just call it horrible building, know how, how tough it is to survive a working day in a horrible building compared to a building which has a nice ventilation and a lot of daylight and so on and so forth. So, but these things are very, very difficult to express in monetary terms. So they are often being neglected. Um, obviously, they're also really, uh, really very valuable environmental benefits like reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing air pollution. And of course, the energy system as such uh, can benefit simply, for example, by avoiding having to build new generation capacity. So one needs to take all these things into account. And uh, our guide is built on five phases. And I will go through these five phases. We actually believe that member states can go through all five phases within 12 months, because that's essentially the time horizon they have until now. I also know that it's normal when uh, transposing directives into national law that member states are often uh, delaying their actions a little bit. Um, so if we take, or if member states take the liberty to add another three months or so, it can definitely be done to go through these five phases. Uh, so let me go through them in, in uh, more detail. The first phase really is, well, the, the, uh, a crucial phase to first of all define who the key stakeholders actually are, who should participate in the development of a national renovation strategy. Um, and we know that the building value chain is rather complex. Um, but we should not only define who should participate, we also need to define where all the information is uh, going to come from which is needed. And 
when you look at the complexity of the value chain in the building sector, uh, you can come up with a drawing like this is a, a, a picture which was developed by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development a few years ago. It, it highlights the diverse range of, of players and actors in that field. And uh, if, you, if you think about these players, you will realize that they have very, very different interests and uh, they will react to a very different set of indicators. And therefore, um, a national renovation strategy definitely needs to include a consultation of all these different groups if it's uh, supposed to be successfully implemented. So the first phase is a relatively easy one. Um, the hard part really comes in, in the second phase um, because we think that, first of all, you really need to know what you actually want to manage. And you, when, you, when you develop a national renovation strategy, you want to manage the existing building stock. We know from our own survey, which we did in 2010, 2011, that there are a lot of data gaps out there, uh, that many member states have relatively little information about the energy performance of the building stock, about age bands, about building types, anything. Um, so it's in, in that phase two, it, it's a must step to really collect all that data. Then, of course, you should use all that data to develop retrofit options. What kind of renovation packages uh, do you want to incentivize? What do you think is really feasible given your, your building stock? You need to look at the costs, you need to do an economic appraisal, and you need to develop an investment horizon. And if you do a little bit of a, a, a checklist for all these boxes I just showed you, I talked, about already, uh, I talked already about the, the building stock um, and what, what you need to know about it. And actually, one very, very important point, and that's very often overlooked as the one at the bottom, ownership and tenure. Who owns the buildings and who lives in the buildings? Do you have a relatively high rental share or a relatively low rental share? And again, when we compare countries within Europe, um, the situation is very, very different from one country to another. You, you have countries where you have a relatively high uh, rental share, so this uh, split ownership, uh, sorry, this, this tenant-owner uh, dilemma is uh, a really a big dilemma, for example, in the, in the German-speaking regions, Austria, Switzerland, uh, Germany, uh, Germany. It's a big problem. In, in other uh, countries, it's not such a big problem. Um, when you look at the renovation options, you want to look at options which really deliver deep energy savings. That are energy savings which are larger than 60%, because this is actually what the Article 4 in the directive is all about. And you should not only look at the direct technical options. Again, this is the phase where you need to quantify the societal benefits, because that, in the end, will have an influence on your cost-benefit analysis. So you want to know how much investment do I actually have to trigger as a government? What kind of incentive systems do I establish for investors to bring me all that money into that sector? And um, we know that the public funding streams will not be alone. So while we have very successful uh, grant schemes and uh, low interest loan schemes in Europe, again, for example, in the KFW program in, in Germany, we know that this money is not enough. So we need to develop new innovative funding sources and funding vehicles to find all that money, which Adrian was talking about in the total of the European context. And um, when we talk about the, the costs and the benefits, again, it is really important to quantify the benefits. Now, it is very difficult to quantify the benefits of reduced air pollution, because yes, you have health statistics, you have uh, you know, even lower mortality and, and things like that, but how to put a monetary value on that is obviously difficult, but it, it needs to be done. Um, the phase three, so after you, you've You've done all that analysis. Um, a member state would want to develop a set of policies to trigger the investments, to trigger deep renovation of the building stock. And in a first step in, in phase three, we think it's important to review the existing barriers. 
and to review um, the existing policy frameworks. We know that there are many barriers. You're all familiar with that because you're all working in the field and they can be classified like this. They can also be classified in any other way. Uh, but the important uh, thing is to recognize is that there are, there are many solutions, many policy solutions, which address different barriers at the same time. So um, if you, for example, have an if you establish an innovative financing vehicle, you will overcome a, a number of different barriers in that. That's a, a, a graph taken from uh, a McKinsey publication. You can, um, again, structure the, the barriers and the solutions in a different way, but the main point here really is that uh, you often can kill more than one bird uh, with one stone because you have all these interactions. Um, when it then comes to really making it happen, the key is to develop an ambitious policy landscape, um, which does not just only consist of, of the traditional legislation, <coughs> building codes and, and, and standards, but also includes technical support, uh, includes fiscal and financial incentives, includes communication and capacity building, because that's, that's key, includes more support for R&D, and um, our report actually has a a longer list of uh, recommendations for each of these circles, but I know that I have now only four minutes left approximately, so I can't go through all of them. Um, but the report is actually available online. Um, a key question to ask, and this is a graph uh, which is not published yet because um, we did a think piece, a, a discussion paper for the Renovate Europe campaign. The, the big question is uh, where do you exactly want to go and we know where we want to be we want to have high renovation rates and we want to have deep renovation so we want to be in, in the uh, right hand upper um, corner there and we're now at the the left uh, corner bottom the question is how do we get there do we get there for example by first increasing the renovation rate very dramatically up to three percent as uh, Adrian suggested earlier and neglect the depth of the renovation, or do we rather train people to really do very deep renovations from now onwards only, and uh, increase the renovation rate only slowly, or is the truth somewhere in the middle? I can't answer that. All I know is that each government, each stakeholder consultation has to answer that question uh, for the national circumstances, but it's an important uh, strategic decision, because your policies will look different whether you follow the, the, the green, the blue, or the red path. And um, again, this is just taken from, from this paper, uh, opportuni uh, potential renovation rate increases. Um, what is clear is that if we want to achieve this 80% energy demand reduction which the European Parliament formulated, and if we want to achieve the 88 to 91 percent CO2 emission reduction, which is part of the low uh, carbon economy roadmap, both values for 2050, then we need to ramp up the renovation rates in Europe very, very quickly. And they need to be in the area of 3 percent, whether they 2.8 or 3.2, doesn't really matter right now, but we need to have a significant ramping up of the renovation rates, otherwise we will never get there. And again, you, I showed this earlier, again, to do that, it's absolutely crucial to uh, consult with, with everybody. I'll just skip through that, it's another illustration. Now, the question, of course, then is, um, are there good examples out there, and is something happening already? And uh, we know that something is happening already, so phase five has already been entered by a few countries, for example, Ireland, and uh, we will hear in, in the next presentation one detailed case study from uh, the Basque country, from Andoni. Uh, but I also wanted to draw your attention to uh, a study which was done by colleagues from BPIE, the policy partners, and it was uh, done for Eurema, actually. Um, this report, which was also recently launched, looked at existing cases of renovation roadmaps. And it analyzed um, well, are these renovation roadmaps actually achieving something or not? And 
the result of this exercise was really that, well, some of them are solid government strategies, uh, others really lack institutional support, some are well-developed plans, others are just long-term targets, visionary targets, but with very little implementation. So the situation out there right now is a relatively mixed bag, um, and so this uh, study also recommends uh, a number of principles to follow, not in a stepwise chronological approach like we do, but I think much of what uh, the policy partners say uh, is really also supported with our work. And what is absolutely crucial is that there is a long-term approach, that there are clear and, and ambitious targets with intermediate milestones, and that there is an action plan how to achieve all those intermediate milestones. The broad involvement I mentioned I think already twice, um, and the holistic approach uh, is relevant because we cannot only talk about residential buildings. Resi residential buildings in Europe make, about, make up about 75% of the floor space. We must cover also the other remaining quarter and I think that commercial buildings often have uh, a different investment profile and investment opportunities compared to uh, residential buildings so sh they should not be uh, left out. Um, again, we should not look only at energy performance goals, we should also look at achieving other societal goals. Uh, we should look at urban development dimensions, at urban regeneration, urban renewal and, and so on and so forth. And um, we should look at the overall structural development for a renovation strategy, so to take into account really all elements. But what is most important, and I really would like to underline that, is that the action is starting now. There is really no reason to, to delay because the targets are clear. We now need to develop the milestones. The member states have to de deliver the renovation roadmap within the, the next 12 months. And uh, so I think it's important that everybody really contributes to that. This is just summarizing what I said earlier. It's really about mobilizing all the stakeholders, all the actors, and uh, because only then we will achieve the CO2 reductions, only then we will have all the economic, the societal, the energy system benefits, and only then uh, will member states be able to meet the requirements of Article 4 of the Energy Efficiency Directive. And with that, I would like to close and invite you all to Brussels in case you are there at the EU Sustainable Energy Week because BPIE will run a workshop there and an afternoon a high-level policy conference on the 26th. Maybe you are there, but um, you will find all that information on our uh, website. And the data portal, which I mentioned earlier in my introduction, <coughs> has the URL buildingsdata.eu. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs>